Hi there lovelies, I'm Rhonda Crimes. I'm a life and leadership coach supporting everyday people just like you to reflect and rework your everyday stories so you can step into the everyday leadership of your families and communities and create compelling, meaningful and fruitful lives every day. And today, let's talk about the neutral universe. Over the past couple of months, I've been talking to you about some principles for conscious living that I learned many years ago from Bill Harris of the Centerpoint Research Institute. And I have to say, when I first heard them, it was pretty confronting. He was telling me that I was creating all the pain and suffering I was experiencing. Fortunately, I have a pretty huge curiosity compulsion so I continued to listen over and over to all of what he said. Now, I'm imagining for many of you, a lot of what I've shared has been confronting for you too. But I hope you can keep your curiosity caps on for a while longer and follow me, because this last one can take a bit to get your head around. Well, it did for me anyway. Bill shared from Swami Satchananda, a popular guru from India in the 70s. Life is meaningless energy, going nowhere for no reason. Bill went on to say that this is often misinterpreted to mean that nothing matters and there is no meaning. But that's not the case. What is being said is that actually everything in our world, yours and mine, has meaning and significance but we are giving that meaning or, and significance you might have learned it unconsciously or someone else has told you and you've made it true within your own internal map of reality as you've grown but they aren't necessarily intrinsic to everyone essentially nothing has any intrinsic meaning if it did, we would all agree on everything, and it simply doesn't happen. So the good news from all of this is that you can assign any meaning you want to any experience. Once you put that meaning on it, it has that meaning for you. Let me give you an example. I choose to believe that my dad, who died in 2006, is still energetically in my life. His physical presence isn't here, but I can feel him and trust that he is still looking out for me. In fact, I also believe he confirms this by placing feathers in my path to remind me. So I'm essentially assigning many meanings in there. I'm choosing to be happy and at peace that he is no longer suffering from the cancer that was eroding his body. I'm choosing to be content that he is still with me in my heart and at the deepest soul or energetic self level. And I'm assigning significance to the feathers I've come across to remind me of him. Now, does everyone believe that? Hell no. Equally, I could choose to be unhappy all the time because he isn't physically present anymore. I could choose to feel abandoned. I could choose to feel alone. I could choose to feel empty. I could choose to remain in a constant state of grief and despair from the sadness of his death. But when I bring that to a conscious level, I know they aren't resourceful options for my own well-being. And frankly, I can hear my dad saying, Akawao ye, stop your havering. We've, we're all doing fine. So just from this example, you can see how from an everyday experience like the death of a loved one, 
we can all choose to respond differently based upon our own internal maps of reality. The good or the bad generalizations we've made from the past, the level of our thresholds for embracing change, the capacity to be okay with everything that happens. We have the ability to witness ourselves in the moment, to really feel the emotions and physiological manifestations of that. And then the choice to respond in a manner that is most resourceful for our ongoing happiness and potential for living a stress-free life. I want to let you know that Maya Managing Emotions booklet, which includes the emotion wheel, is fabulous for identifying emotions more succinctly that can then be linked to more resourceful responses. Use this link, bit.ly forward slash managing emotions with Rhonda. This is a really handy reference to use as you work through the information I've talked about in these videos. So now what I'm about to share with you is what I believe. And this is not the truth, but if I treat it as if it were the truth, I feel much more at ease and connected within the world. There is one energy everywhere and every when, out of which everything grows and everything comes. This energy is aware of itself being everything, everywhere and every when, and is therefore being blissful, happy and peaceful. We are this energy. We are it. We are the foreground and the background. The whole works. Now, some people call this energy God or the universe, or in my coaching, it's shorthanded to source. What I want to impress upon you is that this energy isn't outside of yourself. As I said in the, the practice of witnessing video, it's the watcher part of you that that self with the capital S, aware of itself being everything and everywhere and everywhere. Without the rest of the assigned meanings and levels or degrees of significance our minds have created. All the analyzing and thinking and blaming and suffering is just your mind distracting you from the real you the real one energy. Instead of thinking in a binary manner, bad and good, sad, happy, empty or full, I invite you to consider an alternative viewpoint because all of these things are the same, like two sides of a coin, heads or tails. But if you pick up the head, you're also holding the tail. In Buddhism, there are four noble truths and they point out that all life involves suffering, that suffering is created by desire or attachment and that suffering can be ended by giving up attachment. These truths are based upon an often overlooked but obvious fundamental reality of human existence that all things exist in time and eventually pass. When you aren't getting what you want or maybe getting what you don't want, there is a degree of suffering. But it is equally true that getting what you want also involves suffering. Why is that? Because as with everything else, what you want is temporary. You want to eat that yummy fatty cake, but then it'll be finished. You love to snuggle with your baby, but it will grow up to be a teenager. You're on a fabulous holiday, 
but it'll be over in the blink of an eye. You're alive now, but someday you will die. It's like when I'm reading a really good book, I've become so intimately familiar with the characters and then I realise I'm running out of pages. The book's coming to an end. Suddenly, all the joy and rapture is clouded by the doom of the impending final page and the discomfort that, that I won't be part of this story anymore. The fact is, being overly attached to particular outcomes, like a book lasting forever, a kitten never growing up, or our loved ones never leaving us, causes pain and suffering. But also interestingly, through our cultural conditioning, we're, we're taught to believe that certain emotions are connected to specific events or experiences. It's found everywhere. Children are happy playing with birthday toys. A family is united in their love and humour over shared celebratory meals. The young couple standing in front of their new home are in love. These are examples of centralised meaning and I'm sure you'll recognise that marketing companies and advertisers use them fully to make their messages really stick to your emotions. So they're really powerful. However, as individuals, I encourage you to bring more conscious awareness to the moment. So just recently, my immediate family was talking about Christmas. Now, we have managed for the past 30 or so years to be together as a family of five on Christmas Day. And I would intensely prefer it to be that way. But I know that my children are adults now and that they have independent lives that involve other people that they care deeply for or there are other experiences or adventures that are only available during certain leave and weather opportunities. So I'm unattached to us being together only on the 25th of December. Does that mean I won't do all I can to make it happen or be absolutely overjoyed if we can pull it off for another year? No, definitely not. But equally, I won't be in a state of misery or resentment if it doesn't happen. I know I can choose my response so that whatever happens at Christmas time in this very unusual year that is 2020, I'll be okay with it. And I will still feel loved by my family and I will still love them unconditionally. Either way, there'll be no pain or suffering for me. <laughs> now, I don't want this to sound all Pollyanna or utopian or unrealistic. I am human and I will suffer along the way. But I recognise that the suffering will be caused by me through my attachment to the meanings I make and the levels of desire or significance I place on any given experience or situation. And then I also know I can change that meaning at any time I choose. Simply by bringing more conscious awareness to it and allowing the old belief system that isn't resourceful for me to just slip away and be replaced by a new belief system that functions at a higher level that is resourceful to my continued life journey. And I really want to hit home that you have this choice too. So choose happy, choose content, choose joy, choose gratitude, choose love, choose hope, and choose optimism. I hope you've enjoyed watching this series as much as I've enjoyed sharing it with you. If you have, please be sure to give me a thumbs up and subscribe or 
a like or love and follow on depending on the platform that you're viewing this video on and please remember if your now is not the picture that you've painted for yourself and you'd like any help on this discovery path or maybe something completely different that you intuitively know or feel isn't letting your true colors shine through please get in touch with me you can do it so easily leave me a comment send me a private message drop me an email or pop over to my calendly online diary using the link i provided and we can set up an obligation free curiosity call and see if we're a really good fit for each other much love until next time